Disney is a pale, sad shell of his former self, creatively, operationally, and financially. How did this happen to a once revered and beloved company? There isn't a single simple answer to that, but here's what I saw and how I saw it happen. Disney's first stumble was when they picked an ideological side. Then they waded straight into politics, pushing this new ideological view. Disney's corporate culture, the entertainment products we created, sports and news coverage all pivoted to reflect this view as well, alienating a significant portion of our customers. They lost the trust of the core of Disney's consumers, families. Loss of trust, then loss of interest is breaking the generational brand loyalty, the bond with families that Disney has relied upon. The audience is disappearing. The result is that they've lost much of their fortune as well, if not perhaps the entire company itself. Even its own CEO is showing no confidence in Disney or in himself, despite what he's telling investors and the media. Hello everyone, it's Tim from SpaceNet TV. Let's talk about Disney being a complete and uncontrolled freefall. Since Bob Iger's return as Disney CEO in November 2022, he's been busy doing everything except fixing the problems that he himself started at the company during his first tenure as CEO. His second term has been nothing less than disastrous. Massive box office flops, an unnecessary feud with Florida losing Disney control of the Reedy Creek Improvement District that houses Walt Disney World's theme parks and resorts. Multiple lawsuits and PR disasters, falling revenues in linear broadcast networks, falling revenues in sports broadcasting, the massive failing of Disney Plus streaming service. Amidst all of this, what has Bob been up to? He's been trying to convince everyone that everything is just fine. Oh, uh, you fellas have nothing to worry about. I'm a professional. Bob's been on a media and investor tour, trying to convince everyone that the company is on the right track to recovery that Disney is positioned stronger than ever moving forward, that Disney is still a solid investment for their companies to make. There is definitely no need whatsoever to eject him and the current board due to their mounting failures in favor of angel investor Nelson Peltz, former Disney CFO Jay Rossolo, Rossolo, sorry, Jay, and some new board members taking control. Bob's primary interest now isn't really about saving the company. It isn't about preserving the legacy of Walt Disney. It certainly isn't about preserving investor value. No, for Bob, it's all about saving his image, his reputation, his political aspirations. Now, while Bob has been running around the media circuit spreading this message, getting the remaining Disney grandchildren to shill for him and the current board, Disney continues to burn. To give some perspective and history of it, Disney first started drifting away from Walt Disney's values during the latter years of Michael Eisner's term as CEO. Disney was struggling in the early 2000s. Their stock wasn't performing well. Investors had lost confidence. Eisner himself was not well-liked, particularly after the death of Frank Wells, Disney's chief operating officer. Someone who kept Eisner reined in. Eisner was a micromanager who annoyed and alienated everyone around him. Wells kept Eisner focused on the future and less focused on being the second hand on some poor animator's pencil. Steve Jobs got so annoyed with him once that he actually threatened his life. Ultimately, Eisner, who really wanted to be CEO for life, was forced out of Disney in 2005. A shareholder revolt led primarily by Roy E. Disney, Walt's nephew, ousted him. One of the board's biggest issues with Eisner is that he refused to pick and groom a successor. Michael Ovitz, who the board liked as a successor, only lasted about 14 months at Disney. He could not work with Eisner, and Eisner despised him just as much. You may know the name Michael Ovitz because he left Disney, started a company, and became the first of the super agents, and was the inspiration for the character Bob Sugar in the movie Jerry Maguire. So now there was a vacuum. Frank Wells was gone. Ovitz left in a fit of rage. Eisner was pushed out. Nature abhors a vacuum, and it will fill it with whatever is around. Sadly, Bob Iger was what was around. Now, Bob is a very personable guy, a real smoozer, really affable. You'd like him. I like him. Right up until you don't. Right up until you realize there isn't a lot behind that personality. One thing Bob was absolutely not was creative. He didn't understand creative people. He didn't understand the creative process at all. 
And one thing that many people liked about him as a leader, especially from those on the creative side, is that unlike Eisner, Bob left them alone, let them do their thing. Little did they know that this would come back to haunt them. Taking the helm of an organization whose foundation of success is based on creativity, innovation, excellence, and storytelling uh, was a massive stretch for Iger. Bob, after all, was just mostly a weatherman who failed. Lacking creativity, Bob turned to what he knew, schmoozing, making deals, leveraging his industry connections and Disney's name. Landing as the head of a company that had, in 2005 dollars, $3.3 billion in liquid cash, worth nearly $5 billion in 2024 dollars, was what propelled Bob's early success. Iger completed successful acquisitions of Pixar, Marvel, Lucasfilm, and 21st Century Fox Pictures. Fox was a huge mistake, but that's a topic for another video. Things looked really great for Disney and Iger for a while. Bob's reputation as a mover and shaker was cemented. It seemed as if he could do no wrong. His CEO hair had never looked better. It's not difficult to look like a genius when you have $5 billion in seed capital at your disposal to throw around. You have to be a real major f up on an enormous scale not to look like a genius. Things were going well. Disney was back on top. Then an event happened that broke Disney, broke Hollywood, broke Bob. Are we still on? Hold on. Emergency it was November 2016, and Donald Trump was just elected president. Donald J. Trump is now president of the United States. President Obama is the next president. The election broke a lot of people, particularly in Hollywood, a place where people lived in a political bubble of the entertainment industry, inside the bubble of Los Angeles, inside the bubble of California. These people hadn't smelled the air outside of these bubbles in decades. I don't know if this was the catalyst or if it was just accelerating it, but this is when Bob Iger decided what America needed was bold new leadership to take on Trump. What we needed, what America needed, was him. Bob was going to be president. This is the trailhead of the proverbial slippery slope that Disney has been sliding down ever since. Bob led Disney into picking an ideological side. To run for president, Iger needed to shore up a base, supporters, fans. What better place to do that than at Disney? People started to be hired into key positions for which they were somewhere between modestly to not qualified at all for these positions, save for one important qualification. They had the right political ideology and connections. These people, in turn, hired more people who matched that same set of qualifications or lack thereof. Then in 2017, the Me Too movement came along. This movement started as a pushback against predatory Hollywood executives who abused their positions to take advantage of women, a legitimate cause, a legitimate issue that had been going on since the first talkie was made. Now, I will say that this was never, ever something Bob got into to the best of my knowledge anyway. He is, above all else, an honest guy and a decent devoted family man. The Me Too movement had legitimate beginnings, but the movement went sideways, became politicized, and then weaponized. In Hollywood in general, and at Disney very specifically, it was used as a tool, a tool to get people out of key positions to be replaced by more agenda-friendly people. Then they waded into politics. The new underqualified creatives put into influential positions throughout Disney began to exercise the power of their positions. This was the first signs of Disney becoming more of a platform and less of an entertainment company. Bob's political aspirations died down over time, mostly because Trump seemed, for quite a while, unbeatable for a second term, until a specific disease totally not from a Chinese laboratory turned the world on its ears. But it was too late. Iger had already said publicly that he wasn't going to run because he didn't want to expose his family to the rigors of a campaign and wanted to spend time focusing on his home life, which is code for, as we all know, I don't think I can win. We'll fast forward through the Chapek years. The poor guy was just a patsy so Iger could ride out the closures without the loss of business staining his reputation. Chapek was supposed to be enough of a nebbish that Iger could control him like an animatronic. That didn't work out so well, but we won't dwell on that for now. Let's keep focused where we are. So Bob 2 is out. 
Bob One is back in, and Disney is infected with blue-haired activists using Disney as their platform for change. This is where Iger's hands-off approach to the creative side of the business came back to bite us in the ass. The newly minted SJWs had been exerting their influence over every aspect of Disney. Having run roughshod over Chapek, they were busy pushing the message ahead of everything else. They even got so comfortable and bold as to say the quiet part out loud. Meredith Roberts and like the, the our leadership over there has been so welcoming to like my like not at all secret gay agenda. And like, I was just wherever I could just basically adding queerness to like, the, if you see anything queer in the show, I'm proud of them. But like, I, I just was like, no one would stop me and no one was trying to stop we have me. Many, many, many LGBTQIA characters in our stories and 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 yet we don't have enough leads oh all of our like gender non-conforming characters are in the background kind of the only way to have these like canonical trans characters canonical asexual characters canonical bisexual characters is to give them stories where they can like be their whole selves last summer we we removed all of the um gendered greetings and relationship to our life skills so we no longer say ladies and gentlemen boys and girls um we we've trained we we've provided training for all of our our cast members and in, in relationship to that so now they know it's it's hello everyone or hello friends latoya ravenu was right something had indeed changed disney was moving away from its founding principles of traditional american family values disney was now promoting a very different set of values Values that do not reflect the vast majority of families, but instead caters to pushing an agenda favored by a very small segment of the population. Put a ticket in, make a name and gay! But a very politically strong one. Where once families were entirely comfortable allowing their children to watch Disney's shows without any fear of it containing subject matter that they didn't wish their children to be exposed to, the fun, entertaining shows with positive messages on values age-appropriate characters and stories that you and I would let our children watch were gone. This is how Disney started to lose its audience. Families became distrustful of Disney TV shows and Disney movies. They stopped letting their children watch them before they had a chance to preview it themselves or just found alternative entertainment altogether. They stopped going to Disney movies because not only were they terrible, but they also could not trust the content crowbarred into the stories. They had to be constantly on guard for messages and themes they didn't want their children to be exposed to. Themes that people like Latoya Raveno and her colleagues made sure were in there. The more parents pushed back against this messaging, the harder Disney leaned into it. All the while calling those who objected, who were once called valued customers and friends, were now phobes, racists, and violent alt-right mouth breathers. An odd way to treat your customers, your paying customers. The side effect here is that Disney destroyed their most valuable asset, the one precious thing every company hoped they could acquire, generational brand loyalty, the generational bond that created a chain of parents sharing their love of Disney with their children, who in turn passed it along to their children, who passed it along to their children. It's been severed. These are the very ideals that inspired Walt to build the original Disneyland. Well, it came about when my daughters were very young, and I, Saturday was always uh, Daddy's Day with the two daughters. So we'd start out and try to go someplace with, you know, different things, and I'd take them to the merry ground, and I took them different places, and as I'd sit there while they, uh, they rode the merry ground, did all these things, sit on a bench, you know, eating peanuts, I felt that there should be something built, some kind of a an amusement enterprise built where that the parents and the children could uh, have fun together. A place where families could all have fun together. That loyalty is to a great extent broken, perhaps irretrievably. And now Disney has lost its fortune. Rewind back to February 2021. The totally not China lab ailment was starting to wind down. Bob too was still around and Disney was running pretty high in early 2021. The prospect of getting all the parks around the world reopened without restrictions seemed imminent. Disney Plus was a success during the time where there was an actual captive audience who had nothing else better to do. 
The general public hadn't quite caught on to Disney's theatrical release as being utter garbage. Yet, this was before Black Widow, Jungle Cruise, Shang-Chi, The Eternals released. Wow, that was one hell of a lineup. Also, there was something named Ron's Gone Wrong released in October that year. I was there and I never heard of it. I think it was some 20th century Fox holdover. I don't think we promoted it and I'm not even sure where it was showing. Whatever it was, it bombed too. In February 2021, Disney had a market cap around $320 billion, the most that had ever been worth in history. After a long string of theatrical failures, Disney Plus tanking, more DEI SGW girl bosses reimagining tomorrow. Apparently tomorrow is some kind of really horrible dystopian future. Just a, an utter nightmare. And politically motivated missteps. You could fast forward to this month, March 2024. Disney's current market cap stands at around $200 billion. Disney's experiment in politicizing its entertainment hiring unqualified idiots but checkbox positive directors, writers, and producers, DEI policy, strange mandates and practices, and last but not least, firing Gina Carano from what was the only one bright spot they had going had cost the company nearly 40% of its value. Does that sound like everything is all right to you? It doesn't to me. Does that sound like what Bob is telling everyone, telling the investors, pleading with those investors not to toss him out of the C-suite shower he loves so much? There is no other logical reason to explain this loss other than Disney executive management's complete incompetence. If you need further proof that everything isn't okay, it has recently come to light that Iger quietly sold 80% of his stake in Disney. He is quietly divesting himself of the company's stock cashing out. It has to make you wonder what Bob knows that he's not telling the rest of us. What's driving him to dump his stock after making such sunny predictions of Disney's super bright future? Now, I made a video some time ago about the proxy war being fought between Nelson Peltz's Tryon Group and Ike Perlmutter against Iger and Disney's current board. Nelson is trying to force Iger out and put himself, plus a few others, on the board with an eye towards trying to set things right at Disney. It sure does sound like Iger doesn't have a lot of confidence in his chances to win the proxy war. Maybe he does. Maybe he has something up his sleeve. Maybe he figures the stocks will tank if he wins as investors pull out as well. Who knows? Time will tell. The proxy war will be fought out next month in April during Disney's annual investor meeting. Uh, I've made my position very well known. I've thrown my support behind Nelson Peltz. Where Disney will go from that and how it recovers, it's going to be one of two very different tracks. If Bob Iger and the current board prevail, I think we're going to see more of the same until eventually they're going to have to start cannibalizing it and selling pieces off to stay afloat. If Nelson takes over, I'm not sure whether Nelson is fully aware of how to de-woke Disney without just gutting everything that's there. Uh, he's going to have a hell of a job ahead of him in order to do that. But at least he understands what's going wrong. He understands that Disney is losing money because of his politicalization. It's losing money because of his poor products. It's losing money because of his dedication to ideology rather than entertainment. And I wish him luck if he wins. Anyway, that's how I see it. Tell me how you see it in the comments below. I'll be back real soon with another video. Until then, you take care. Bye for now.